Hello guys and welcome back to my YouTube channel. If you're new here, my name is Jessica and I'm a third year PhD student at the University of Aberdeen and I study in the field of natural products chemistry. So today I thought I would do a little question and answer video because I haven't done one in quite a while and I've been getting the same sort of questions on my videos for a while now so I just wanted to address some of those questions and I also did a question and answer box on my Instagram. I will link my Instagram page down below if you want to have a look and I got a few good questions on there as well that I would just like to come on here and answer those questions. So let's jump right into it. The first question I got was, what would I change about my PhD if I could go back to the beginning and start it again, knowing everything that I know now? So I think one of the main things that I would do if I got to start my PhD all over again would be to decide from the beginning to do a thesis by publication. So at my university, you can do two different types of thesis. You can do a thesis by publication, which means that you write I don't know how many it is exactly, but I think four or three first author papers and you have to have contributed to, I think, maybe one other paper as well. And then this is your thesis. All of these papers make up the basis of your thesis. A traditional thesis is when you just do all your work and you write it up in a story-like fashion, telling the whole story in different chapters and it's not on a publication basis. There's two different types of thesis types and I wish from the beginning that I had decided to do a thesis by publication because in my opinion it seems like the must, much easier route and obviously like you're planning for these publications so you're going to get x amount of publication at the end of your PhD. Otherwise you're writing your thesis and you're also trying to write papers which don't go in your thesis and it just seems more logical to me to write these papers and they make up the basis of your thesis. I'm in my final year now, so it's a bit late to be thinking about this, but yes, this is one thing that I would change if I could go back to the beginning of my PhD again. Also, I would do a lot of my experiments differently, but of course that just came with experience and with learning in the lab, and that's not something that I could have done from the beginning of my PhD, but if I could start it all over again, there is definitely a lot of things with my data analysis and my experiments in the lab that I would change completely. <laughs> Okay, moving on. Someone asked me, why did I decide to do a PhD? I really enjoy learning and the good thing with a PhD is that you're constantly learning new skills, you're constantly learning new information, you're reading, you're researching, and there's just always a chance for increasing your knowledge and for learning new things. And that was something that was really appealing to me when I was deciding kind of what I wanted to do. If you watch my video about my PhD journey, um, I will link it down below or I will link it up here. <laughs> you will see that I did not go straight from my undergraduate degree to my PhD. I did actually work in industry in between. And yeah, at that point, I just kind of wanted to return to academia. The PhD position was available and that's why I decided to do my PhD. Go and watch the video if you want more information about that. Also, I have to admit that having the title of doctor is actually pretty cool as well. So that was kind of a little reason why I wanted to do a PhD also. But of course, it wasn't the main reason. A question that's come up quite a lot is how I use my iPad as a PhD student. So I was going to do a whole separate video on this, but I don't actually think I can speak for long enough to do a whole video on how I use my iPad, but I have the 12.9 inch iPad Pro 2021 edition. And so it's a very big tablet and I also have the Apple Pencil. And I like to use my iPad in various different ways for my PhD. So the way that I've used it has kind of changed um, as I've gone along my PhD, but the main reason I use it is for my daily planner. So I have mentioned in previous videos, if you have a look at my planning and organization video, I like to use a digital planner instead of a paper planner. And I do all of this on my iPad. So I use an app called Zinnia. And here I have my planner for the whole month. I have a weekly planner, I have a daily planner, I also have sections where I can take notes and where I can make goals and I feel as a PhD student it's just incredibly important to stay organised and to have um, your projects and your weeks and your days really well planned out so I find that my iPad is incredibly useful for that. I also like to write out my plans and write out my notes so that's where the Apple Pencil comes in really really handy but I know some people like to use Notion for planning or like to just use some other form of digital planning on a computer where you can type out all of your thoughts and all of your plans but for me personally I like to write so that's why the iPad and the Apple Pencil comes in really really handy. 
I also use GoodNotes 5 on my iPad for taking some notes. I kind of have a variety of different platforms where I take my notes. In my lab book, which is just a normal traditional lab book, I also take some notes on Word, but I do actually like to write out some notes on GoodNotes as well. It just depends on the situation really. But GoodNotes is good because you can actually take pictures and insert them into your notes um, as the iPad has a camera. So it's been really useful for kind of learning how to use specific instruments. GoodNotes is a really good app if you need to study because you can take handwritten notes and you can also kind of import notes from different places and include it in your document. Other apps that I like to use on my iPad include Canva. So Canva is a website where you can make um, Instagram posts, you can also make YouTube thumbnails, but you can also make posters and presentations for conferences or um, just for your PhD project. So Canva works similarly to Microsoft PowerPoint, but it has a lot of different kind of graphics that you can use and templates that you can use for making posters and for making presentations. So I like to use the app on my iPad because it's a bit bigger than using it on my phone or if I don't have my laptop because it can also be accessed online. So if you're looking for a new way of making posters and presentations and general graphics and figures for your project, then Canva is a really good one that you should consider downloading. Another way I like to use my iPad is I like to read papers on my iPad. So I find it difficult reading papers on a laptop or a computer screen. I feel like with the iPad, you can kind of hold it more like a book, if that makes sense. My iPad is the 12.9 inch, which is almost like an A4 piece of paper. So it just saves me from printing off the paper and having lots of different papers lying about. I can just download them onto my iPad and read them on there. Finally, there's just a few other apps that I like to use, such as the Outlook app for my emails, also Microsoft Teams, because that's the platform we use for online meetings in my lab. And of course, for Zoom calls as well, using the iPad works the same way as a computer. Okay, moving on. So someone asked me, what is my research topic? So if you don't already know, I am studying in the field of natural products chemistry, which is basically studying the compounds and the metabolites produced by living organisms. So this could be uh, microbes such as bacteria and fungi, or it could be marine invertebrates, which is what I work on. So marine invertebrates such as marine sponges and corals, anemones, sea slugs, and so on. So we study the compounds produced by these organisms to see if we can get inspiration for new drugs, but my project doesn't focus on medicines, it actually focuses on anti-fouling compounds. I won't get into too much detail, I do have various videos where I I show kind of posters and presentations that I have prepared for conferences where I do give an introduction to my project but to explain anti-fouling a little bit Anti-fouling refers to a buildup of organisms on ships and oil and gas rigs and offshore um, structures as well for renewable energy and I'm trying to find compounds produced by living organisms which could be used as inspiration to prevent the buildup of these organisms. To not go into too much detail, the organisms can cause a variety of problems such as ecological problems, also economic losses for these different maritime um, industries. I actually have a paper coming out soon where I review all of these problems. We do have anti-fouling agents which are currently being used but studies are showing that these can actually be toxic to marine wildlife and can pollute our coastlines. So that's why we're trying to look at nature for inspiration to make new environmentally friendly anti-fouling compounds. I hope that makes sense. I tried to explain that really, really briefly because I don't want to focus on it for too long. But if you do have any questions about what I get up to in my project and what my project's all about, please do leave some comments in the comments box below. Somebody asked me, is my PhD funded? Yes, my PhD is funded. I honestly don't think I would have taken the PhD position if I wasn't getting funded. So I get a monthly stipend, which is basically a salary um, to live off of, but my consumables in the lab, so all of the chemicals and glassware and anything else that I need for conducting my experiments, I also have funds to purchase those items. I also have a research travel grant, which means that I can go to nice conferences all over the world. I can go on my research field trip to collect my samples on the west coast of Scotland, um, as you would have seen from my last vlog. 
and yeah I'm very fortunate to have a funded PhD project but like I said I probably wouldn't have taken the PhD project if it was not funded as of course I feel like I need to get paid for the work that I do because PhD projects are still contributing to the wider scientific community and also from a financial point of view I yeah just can't afford to not get paid for four years of my life doing a PhD. Okay, moving on. So the next question I got was, do I only do lab work or do I do classes alongside my lab work? You may have seen my video that I conducted with Annie O'Chan, who is here on YouTube. She is a great PhD YouTuber who's coming to the end of her PhD. So congratulations, Anne. And we compared PhD programs in Canada and in the UK. So if you watch that video, I mentioned in the video that in the UK we don't actually have classes, so our PhD program is only research work. I know that in the States and in Canada it's quite different because you have to go through a set of classes, then you have to propose like your dissertation or your thesis plan, but in the UK we start the PhD program and we get stuck in straight away into the lab work. So in short, no, I do not have to do any classes unless I feel like I want to do some classes to kind of increase my knowledge, but we are not marked, we are not graded for these classes, that's just a personal choice, and I only do lab work. The next question I got on Instagram was, who is my favourite lab mate? Hint, hint, she's Italian and loves pizza. <laughs> Federica, shout out to you. <laughs> I'm not going to be biased and choose any of my lab mates as my favourite. I have a group of very great friends in my lab that I'm very grateful for and you are all equally as amazing as each other. <laughs> the next question I got was what's the hardest thing about doing a PhD? So I could probably make a whole video on this but I think the biggest adjustment when you do a PhD is that kind of sense of independence that you have. When you're doing a PhD it's very independent work, you have to generate new ideas, you have to plan on a daily basis how you are going to conduct your work and you have to be very independent and you manage your own work essentially. In my case I do that because my supervisor is quite relaxed and he just leaves me to get on with my work. I do understand that different supervisors might be a bit more active in the projects and deciding what has to be done on a week-to-week -week basis but for me I decide everything. So I think that can be quite challenging because sometimes you don't know if you're making the right decisions or if you're making the wrong decisions and yeah it's a big adjustment going from undergraduate degree where you're being told you have to do this by this deadline and then you come to a PhD and you are your own boss essentially on a daily basis. I know you have your supervisor so you're not exactly your own boss but you are still making your own decisions on what you need to do and what are your next steps on your own. So I think that's been the most challenging part for me, kind of believing in my own decisions and believing in my kind of new ideas. Of course I have my supervisor there for support and you should use your supervisor to kind of confirm your ideas and confirm your plans but a PhD can be tricky in many ways but I definitely think the kind of independent side of thing has been quite challenging for me but it's also quite nice because you don't have someone checking in on you necessarily every day. Well I don't in my situation. <laughs> but like I say, depending on your supervisor, you might have a completely different scenario. Someone from Instagram asked me, how do I stay active during the day and give it 100% every single day? In all honesty, I sometimes don't manage to give it 100% every day. I sometimes do not manage to stay fresh and active all through the day. We're humans and we're not robots, right? So trying to give 100% output every single day is not always possible. However, I do always try and reach my goals every single day. I write up a to-do list at the beginning of the day. If there's important things that 100% need to be done, they will get done on that day. I feel like I'm getting better at prioritizing tasks. Before I used to make a to-do list that was the size of my arm and would try and complete all of these tasks and would literally be running around left, right, center in order to complete all of these things on my to-do list. I think the most important thing is keep a solid plan and maybe even time block out from nine o'clock to 10 o'clock I'm going to do this, from 10 o'clock to 11 o'clock I'm going to do this and I find that that keeps me very focused and motivated during the day. Motivation maybe isn't the right word, let's say disciplined during the day. So I feel like even if you don't 100% feel like doing the work, if you really need to complete X amount of tasks in your day in order to reach your goals, then you just need to be disciplined and you just need to be organized and 
Quite frankly, you just need to get it done. But like I say, sometimes there's an afternoon where I really don't want to do anything and I try to find the tasks that I do want to do in those situations. So maybe I don't feel like going in the lab, but I know that I have to do revisions for a manuscript because the reviewers have replied with some comments. So maybe I don't want to be in the lab, but I'm okay with sitting at my computer. So I will sit at the computer and I will do that. And it means that I'm not wasting a whole afternoon of doing nothing. It's about finding the tasks that you want to do in order to still tick off everything that you need to do for the week. I don't know if that made any sense because I feel like I just kind of went round in a big circle, but hopefully that was clear enough. I also think it's really important to take breaks. You might think that the day is only so long, but trust me, if you take breaks, you take maybe a break in the morning to eat a snack and to have five minutes to just breathe, and then you take some time for lunch to properly switch off for a while, you'll be so much better in the long run and you will feel less burnt out come the end of the day, come the end of the week, come the end of the month because you have allowed yourself to take those breaks and you've not just been work, 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 work. Again, that comes back to prioritizing your tasks, prioritize the things that you need to get done. And if you don't manage to get those things done that aren't a priority, then don't worry. They will get done at some point, but you don't have to think about them now because there's more important tasks to complete. And finally, someone asked me, what is the best part about doing a PhD? So again, I did actually make a full video on my favorite things about doing a PhD, but just to summarize them quickly, I really enjoy that I'm learning new things on a daily basis because like I said, I really enjoy studying. I also enjoy that I can share my knowledge with others through presentations, through demonstrating in the undergraduate labs. I've also had experience teaching and I really, really enjoyed that. And yeah, I enjoy that a PhD is so diverse. Every day is different. One day you could be doing a presentation, the next day you could be working in the lab all day, the next day you could be writing a paper, you could be reading papers. So every day is just so different and I like that dynamic feeling that a PhD has. I honestly think I would get bored if I was sitting on the computer every day or if I was in the lab every day. So just having that bit of versatility just kind of mix things up on a daily basis is really what excites me about doing a PhD. So that is all of my questions for this question and answer video. Thank you so much if you made it this far and let me know if you enjoy these types of videos or if you have any more questions, please do ask them in the comments box below. Thank you again for watching and I will see you guys in my next video. Bye.